morning, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Martin Ryman. I'm an associate professor both in the College of Veterinary Medicine and at the Eller College of Management. I'm uh, honored and very proud to introduce uh, the research series on the human-animal uh, bond and the relationships that uh, we have with animals. Talk very briefly about what this uh, series is about. So the intent is uh, to feature regular scholarly talks and discussions on a variety of topics surrounding human-animal relationships. And our affiliates investigate different facets of the human-animal bond, broadly construed. And collectively, we have a, a broad set of expertise in veterinary medicine, animal cognition, anthropology, interpersonal psychology, and human decision-making, among other disciplines. And our affiliates have joined appointments in other academic areas of the US, uh, of the University of Arizona. I'd also like to mention um, that there are opportunities to get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm showing the link here and I'll post the link later in the chat so you can keep up to date uh, regarding the speaker series. There's also um, the possibility to engage with us in, in research opportunities. So that may be something for um, the doctoral students in this area. Our affiliates are uh, Professor Evan McLean, who's in the audience, um, Professor Jennifer Vishni and, and myself. And we'd like to build this up. So if you um, are interested in joining us, please uh, feel free to get in touch with us and we'd love to have you on board as well. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, have Zeni um, here as our first speaker, the inaugural speaker. Zeni is an associate professor at the University of Tennessee in veterinary medicine. And um, our second speaker will be Dr. Kerry Rodriguez from Colorado State uh, later this semester. Uh, we'll email registration links um, for upcoming events. It's my pleasure uh, to have Dean Julie Funk here and uh, Senior Associate Dean Alex Ramirez, who will provide a couple opening remarks and introductions. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you, Martin, and thank you to you and, and the team for working to get the um, research series uh, initiated and organized. So I think it's really exciting there. Again, we have very many exciting milestones when you're a new college. And this is a really exciting milestone for us in, in sponsoring our first research series. Uh, this is an area of research in which the college wants to help develop expertise, both from how important it is to society around animal and human relationships and, and how important it is to veterinary medicine. Um, so I'm really excited to see this series kicked off and I'm looking forward to Dr. Eng's presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Appreciate the opportunity again. Thanks for Martin for get, helping get this started. Thanks again, Evan and Jennifer for being part of this committee. I think it's important for the college to have a mark, right? Especially in that research arena to help all of us learn a little bit more. Um, and even more exciting is to have, like it's mentioned, to have our first speaker, great speaker, right? Uh, Dr. Jenny Ng is here with us, who is a clinical associate professor uh, from the uh, in community practice from the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, he got his uh, veterinary degree from Cornell University uh, and completed a small animal rotating internship at the Berg Memorial Animal Hospital of the ASPCA in New York before, since he didn't have anything else to do to try to work on a combined ABVP for both canine feline residency and a master's degree in human animal bonds uh, studies uh, through the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine. He's published research uh, investigating the effects of animal assisted interventions on the behavior and physiology of animals themselves, um, and also has some clinical interest of uh, uh, behavior, dentistry, preventive medicine, and management of gastrointestinal and renal diseases. Um, with that, today he's gonna be talking to us on assisting the animal in the animal assisted interventions. Um, and, and the synopsis is when the goal of animal assisted interventions is to achieve positive effects for the human participant, it is easy to overlook the effects of the animal itself. 
animal welfare research in, in the AIE area explores the benefits and consequences of these human animal interactions. So with this, it is a great privilege to have our first speaker, uh, Dr. Ng. All right, well, thank you very much and good morning to everybody. Um, hopefully everyone can hear. And I just wanted to start by uh, giving everyone here a heartfelt and warm thank you for this amazing invitation and opportunity to be with all of you. Um, Dr. Ryman uh, Ramirez and Dr. Funk, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for all the people. I know it always takes an army to get something like this together and in motion. So um, I'm so impressed and so uh, thankful that you have put your effort Efforts towards uh, this area, which a lot of vet schools might not uh, put their put forth interests or like prime interests in. So um, it is uh, it is an honor to be one of your first uh, first guests, and I'm happy to to kind of uh, take this off. So uh, today we're going to be talking about assisting the animal and animal assisted interventions, and as um, was stated, I am a veterinarian first and foremost. I teach, I love teaching um, all of our veterinary students in small animal primary care. And that's my main hat. But my other hat that I kind of wear at night is my research in all of this area regarding the human animal bond and human animal interactions. So I figured that I would, um, there's so much to share and so much to talk about, which I know that you guys will have lots of really great seminars um, on this throughout this semester. But today, um, I'm going to take little bits of pieces and take you through my interests and sort of uh, my interest in, in research in this area. We're going to um, go over some animal welfare issues and animal assisted interventions, the status of IACUCs and animal assisted intervention research, uh, knowing about adverse events that actually occur in animal assisted interventions, how we measure welfare and well-being in these animals, and where do we go in the future with all of this? Um, so I'm hoping to stir up a, a lot of conversations and lots of questions. I know that uh, Dr. Dr. Riemann, you're going to be monitoring the chat. Um, and if at any point, uh, please stop me, and I'll kind of see if, if I can address whatever question that we have in the, in the moment that we have them. But otherwise, I might uh, save some questions toward the end as well. But I really hope to, to have your engagement. So thank you for being here. So starting off, I always want to start off with the definition of the human animal bond. I really like this definition that is defined by the AVMA as a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and other animals that is influenced by behaviors that are essential to the health and well-being of both. The reason why I really like this definition, uh, because everybody's going to have their own understanding of the human animal bond, but I really like their emphasis and focus on the words mutually beneficial and health and well being of both. Because as we know, um, that the human animal bond only works uh, if it's a two way street, that both a uh, human and animal in that relationship and in that interaction should benefit in order to really, uh, to really reap upon the benefits that the, that brings. And that's really, there's so much fascination in the science of this and exploring the science of it, because it really is. It's what is it about animals that when we're having a really tough and really hard day that uh, we come home and we see our fluffy, furred or scaled creature, um, non-human animal at home to pretty much turn that frown upside down. Uh, all of us can relate. If you have an animal, you can relate to this and this feeling that, uh, that this brings us. And that's really the basis of why no matter where you go, no matter, um, you can't pick up a magazine, a uh, newspaper article, or scroll the internet without seeing the countless number of articles all about the way in which animals influence our lives. And especially when it comes to therapy animals, that uh, it's always true that whenever disaster strikes, there's always some uh, silver lining of a heartwarming story of an army of therapy dogs that come in and save the day. And it's, it's really amazing. It's a really part of our culture and who we are to kind of go towards animals to, when, we, when we're seeking comfort. And th that really is an amazing thing because they do bring us, that really goes into the research about the benefits of human-animal interaction and how that changes us physiologically, behaviorally, mentally. And we really, and we focus on that. However, a lot of times we have to ask ourselves, what about the animal in these cases? Uh, it's all about 
it's usually about people like it being like, oh my goodness, it's amazing to have this animal here. But what about the animal? What's going on in that animal's mind whenever we are putting them in, at, in front of people at the times of crisis? Are, do they get those same warm, fuzzy feelings? Uh, do they get the same calmness and effects whenever they are able to do that? Do they feel a sense of, of pride about volunteering for these efforts? How do we really know this? And so that really uh, brings into like my passion, which is welfare uh, with, with animals in general, but especially in animals animal assisted interventions. I always like to use my soul dog. This is Grace. Um, she was my first golden retriever uh, who I hold in, near and dear to my heart. And I do call her my soul dog because I know that all of us, a lot of times we have one who we know that whenever we go to the other side, she's going to be the first one there who's going to be wagging her tail to, to see me again. And I can say that she was like the premier therapy, therapy dog. She was the best dog that I could have ever asked for. And she she went into every person's uh, embrace with a wagging tail and that smiling mouth. Um, and just no matter who she met, she just uh, seemed to love her job, which is what a lot of uh, therapy animal handlers will tell you is that, yeah, my animal loves, my, loves her job, that she loves going to nursing homes, she loves visiting with children and, uh, and all of that. And so for the most part, we can anthropomorphize and we can put those emotional, those human emotions towards this animal. But there are times where, even though most of the time I think that she was happy, I think there, there were other times where she might not necessarily have always felt that. And these are the instances where you can see in this picture that you can see it in her face. She's like, dad, what are you doing to me? What is going on right here, right here, right now? And I wonder in this, in this photograph, how often does this happen? How how often do we as, as therapy animal volunteers, when we're trying to like kind of bring joy to other people, that we really put our animals at the forefront and almost like sacrifice them because we want to be the do-gooders. And that really drives this question of that, even though she was a great dog and I, she would never, um, or I can, we always say never, but I can expect that she would never have bitten another person or showed aggress aggression. It just shows that she's a good dog. And most of these dogs that are therapy animals are very good. They are screened, that they are behaviorally trained to make sure that there is no aggression. But uh, when we put them in these situations, and even though that they tolerate these like tight hugs or so, Tolerance does not necessarily equate to good welfare. And I think that should be a big take home point because even though you have a good dog who's going to be very well behaved, it does not necessarily mean that they're having a good time. Uh, so I think that there are a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of other scholars kind of bring this the same issue up about special considerations for these therapy animals. I really like this quote that says, no other canine related event, no sport nor competition requires a dog to enter the intimate zones of unfamiliar humans and remain there for several minutes of petting and hugging. And that resonates so true with me because I think about that, that uh, we don't put, uh, we really ask these dogs to do something that is so unlike what they would do in a natural <laughs> environment because if you think about it like what would you feel like if you walked down like the down a, a street and every stranger came up and accosted you with a hug or pets or whatever else uh so it really is we're, we're asking them to do something that is very unique other people have kind of explained and argued that it's moral and exploitative, especially because these animals have little self-control over their social lives. They can't escape um, or avoid unpleasant social intrusions. There's concern about fatigue and burnout syndrome, especially when we're asking them to do these jobs for so many hours a day or uh, multiple days a week, especially when we're talking about another issue of like service and, and assistance animals who are pretty much on call 24 seven. And of course, the other thing that we have to think about when we're putting these animals in these situations, the risks of acquisition of infectious disease and zoonotic diseases, especially when we're talking about long-term healthcare facilities. So uh, with all of the animal assisted intervention, human animal interaction research out there, most of the research out there is about looking at the impact of animals on human outcomes, which is noble, which is why we're all here. We're studying the, the science of the effects about it. And when research is conducted, what we usually assume from this research is, and animal assisted interventions are that 
all human animal interactions are safe and that these interactions pose no risk to animal welfare. Because again, theoretically, we are working with healthy, um, behaviorally sound animals. But in exploring this research, and it really is, there's so much really exciting things, uh, so much exciting stuff in this field um, that uh, continues and continues. But in looking at the literature, I there were things that stood out to me. So uh, in a couple of these articles, this, uh, this first article that I'm bringing to your attention, it's called The Animal Assisted Therapy as Pain Relief uh, Intervention for Children. Now, this was a very, very well done study about looking at the impact of therapy dogs for children in hospital prior to prior to undergoing procedures and they were just looking at their the anxiety levels of children again it's very human centric about looking at that human however if you look take a look in the methods in this article um section what i what really highlighted and jumped out at me was that unfortunately the desire, desired sample size of 94 children was not achieved due to the death of an animal assisted therapy dog prior to the conclusion of the study the animal therapist died peacefully in her home in the care of her handler. And that was pretty much all that was said in, it, in this article about, uh, about that. It was kind of like an open and closed, uh, closed book on that. And that just led me to all these questions about, wait, what happened to this dog? What did, they, what did she die from? Like, why was she still being used uh, during this time? Did they, was she sick? Was there some sort of chronic disease or illness? So I got my head scratching uh, for a very good article that had a good impact on children. But really, I was like, well, what happened to the dog? In this study, this was another study that actually took a look at the impact of therapy sessions on the dogs themselves. So this was one that took a look at the length or duration of a break on, on the work on the stress levels of, the, of these dogs. And in this study, so again, a noble, one of those, one of those interesting uh, kind of early on studies that started taking a look at the welfare of therapy animals. And in this study, similar to the previous one that we just talked about, they stated that one elderly animal assisted therapy dog completed a shift without the treatment session and died before her next scheduled shift was completed. Again, those same issues and same questions kind of brought up as, as that previous study. And again, this study was focused on, uh, on animal outcomes. So I was like, what, what happened here? And a third study, and this is probably the first one that uh, that came out. This was a published in 1999. Um, so really progressive, uh, really took a look at uh, the effects of therapy animals on severely disabled children. So this uh, this study took a look at a look at the effect of one therapy dog. He was like kind of a black lab mix, um, an eight year named Cody, and he was about eight years old, and he was used for all of these sessions for multiple sessions a week, multiple sessions a day with children who were um, who were diagnosed with other with a variety of mental mental conditions. And throughout this, what they noticed in this study, and they were focusing again on the children in this study. However, what they noticed was that Cody, like halfway through the study, was uh, he was getting uh, recurrent urinary tract infections, ear infections, and was just not himself. And what these authors and researchers kind of uh, noticed was that uh, it often, these interactions often resulted in the animal being deluged by children, some of whom deliberately tried to injure him. These incidents were unsettling to him, causing him to react with tentative, to tentativeness for periods of time thereafter. So that in of in itself is, is concerning. And what they, they brought him to the vet, they, they went for multiple veterinary visits. And what they recognized was that the development of his ear and urinary tract infections in Cody and subsequent development of Cushing syndrome may be the result of his high chronic stress level. And if you don't know, Cushing syndrome, hyperadrenocorticism hyper is kind of a hypersecretion of cortisol from your adrenal glands, which results in this whole slew of physiologic changes to, um, to that animal. And so what they kind of suggested was that maybe Cody was super highly stressed at all times because of the work that he was doing with these children. Um, and at the end of the day, what they concluded was that this lack of consideration for the well-being of the animal utilizing this program necessitated a decision to end the therapy program. Again, uh, I, I very much 
appreciate and am respectful of these authors because they were they sought out to look at the impact of this the therapy dog on children, but they weren't able to complete the study because they noticed that this was of significant compromise to this animal's welfare. So, and they were able to publish this and uh, were still able to tell Cody's story years and years later. So all of these kind of led me to think, what what else is out there? Who what is going on with these therapy animals? How are they being treated in, in research? Um, and wanted to bring up the point that throughout all studies, we protect the welfare of human beings. So if ever we're looking at the impact of something on a human, we know that we go through the IRB and it is a rigorous process to ensure that we keep in line with the ethics of, of human research and making sure that we are respectful to all human beings. But on the opposite token, who's responsible for monitoring the welfare of animals in, in therapy work, in therapy research and animal assisted intervention research? Is it the handler who's involved? Is it the PI, the researcher, the investigator? Is it the institution itself? Is it a certifying organization? Or is there a body of experts that oversees the humane and ethical use of these animals? And so I'm assuming that I'm talking to mostly to people within the College of Veterinary Medicine who knows what an IACUC is. Uh, it's funny because whenever we talk about this amongst social science researchers, they might not, they absolutely know what an IRB is, but they might not know that an IACUC, an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee actually exists to oversee the welfare of animals. Um, so, what I was interested in was that in animal-assisted intervention research, uh, consideration for IACUC approval has varied, uh, like based on the on the literature that I had seen. I'm like, you know what? Somebody usually were required to write down that this had been approved by IACUC number or whatever in uh, in a manuscript, but it's rarely used among social scientists uh, because animals aren't the subject of the research, but the, rather they're considered tools or the instruments to conduct that research and look at an impact, the same way that we would look at the effect of a drug on a human outcome. And also bringing in the notion that specific journals may or may not require an IACUC approval. So in order to kind of uh, kind of investigate this further, I wanted to de determine the status of IACUC use in animal-assisted intervention research. So uh, what we did was we reported the percentage of studies published in Anthrozoos that reported IACUC approval. So if you don't know, Anthrozoos is the premier journal of the International Society of Anthrozoology, uh, which pretty much that is where a, a lot of the research on human animal interaction goes. It can obviously you can publish anywhere, but that's kind of like our kind of gold standard, if you if you will, of, of journals that has been around since 1989. Um, and so we looked at from 1989 up until 2016 at all the articles um, that, that there were. We wanted to document the characteristics of animals used in animal assisted intervention research and also describe if there were any adverse outcomes in those animals. So um, oh, we looked at 594 articles that were published, sorry, those dates were wrong, from 1987 to 2016. And the inclusion criteria for our kind of uh, retrospective review was looking at for any studies that were prospective in nature, included a live animal and used that live animal to affect a human outcome. Exclusion criteria for these manuscripts were anything that involved service animals or were just uh, talking about pet ownership. So we really wanted to look at a true animal assisted intervention or kind of therapy work. Um, and we used descriptive statistics to kind of figure out to the um, or to, to demonstrate and illustrate how often IACUCs were used. So as far as the main results, I won't go into, into full details about this study, but what I thought was interesting was that out of those 594 uh, manuscripts, that 61 publications met the criteria of using a live animal to, uh, in a prospective way to affect a human outcome. Out of those, only five out of those 61 reported IACUC approval. So that's 8% of articles that actually said, yes, we did this study with IACUC, with IACUC approval. In addition, what I also thought was interesting was that, yeah, in social science, we all get IRB approval, right? Um, well, in amongst all these articles, actually out of those 61, 
less than half actually reported in that manuscript that they had IRB approval, even though that they were affecting a human outcome. So that just kind of goes into, okay, like obviously uh, anthrozoos didn't have that requirement uh, to have that in the, in the manuscript, but it's definitely something that should be considered. In addition, about the about the animals, most of these studies were conducted with dogs. I think about um, I have the specific numbers, but uh, more than seventy five percent of the articles involved dogs. And the next most frequent species that were using these articles were horses. Um, and what uh, we found was that I wanted to see how many of them actually had formal training um, or were actually credentialed to be a true animal assisted therapy animal. And only 44% reported that the animals had proper credentials. Otherwise, they were just kind of seen as being pet dogs or like a researcher's personal dog or, or so without official training or screening. And only two thirds, so 66% of these studies reported specific details about the animals that were used. Um, so whether or not that they used uh, how old those animals were, what sex they were, and what breed. So your, your basic signalment of animals. And uh, by and large, I actually thought that, uh, and so I just put up uh, which breed that to most breeds of dogs that were most frequently used. And I was surprised to see that terrier breeds were the most frequently reported, most frequent therapy animal, followed by a poodle, followed by golden retriever, followed by German shepherds um, in four studies. And finally, only a third of them actually reported the health status or that to these animals in these studies had received veterinary care or, or that had veterinary screening. So again, like another aspect that just shows that, hey, were these animals really watched out for and, to, and taken care of in these instances? The other thing about this uh, about this investigation was that we took a look, we read through all these articles to kind of see were there any adverse outcomes that happened um, in any of these studies. And we did find three studies that did report adverse outcomes, similar to what I kind of demonstrated before about those dogs that had died in, in, in those studies, except those were not published in anthrozoos. So in out of the anthrozoos studies that had happened, um, two studies were actually done by Nancy G, who is uh, who is one of our other premier um, anthrozoologists and investigative researchers, um, who kind of reported in the acknowledgments. It wasn't in the methods section, but she it was kind of an honor to the dog Louie, who was a therapy dog in these studies, who was taken prematurely by lymphoma after the completion of this research. So again, like uh, we can't uh, correlate or or say causation was was a part of the development of lymphoma, but I thought that this was a very honorable way to kind of just show respect for that for the animals that were used. But I did think that it was interesting that she did report that uh, this dog died a little bit early, like that this dog probably shouldn't have gotten lymphoma or it was not typical for this dog to develop lymphoma at this age. In addition, um, the, the other study that we found with an adverse outcome was a study done out of the University of Pennsylvania, which looked at the effect of therapy animals on reminiscence in college students. And uh, they used two dogs in this study. And uh, again, kind of in the acknowledgments or it was in the discussion section that um, Dr. Hunt had reported that sadly, one of the dogs used in the study, the Toller, who received AKC CGC certification, developed behavioral problems after the study was completed and was retired from work. Um, so I, I really think that it was impressive that to, they, they kind of stated this in the manuscript, first of all, all that they had said the specific thing. They, they had, had provided the details about this toller, and they obviously said that he maintained CGC certification. And it wasn't until after the study was done that they noticed that this dog had behavioral problems. And what they are assuming or what they are implicating was that his role in this research resulted in behavioral issues. And again, like that, he was retired from work, uh, another uh, very impressive thing that I think that, that these authors are being transparent about these animals.
So these are just examples about these adver about adverse events that happen. And my other area of kind of interest is adverse events that happen in therapy animal work, because we don't talk about that. Nobody ever focused. Everybody's like, oh yeah, it's safe. And like these animals are happy, people are happy. Nothing, what bad things can ever happen. But this is another thing that I'm going investigation for about adverse events of that, that do happen. We can never say that they never happen. Uh, so what we define this as an adverse event is an undesirable or unexpected experience that occurs as a result of human animal interaction that negatively impacts the participant or the handler or animal, the environment in which they're working or any bystander that is within that environment or any combination of these. So you might ask, like, how can an adverse event happen in an animal-assisted therapy session? Well, of course, the, the number one thing that we think of and that we hope that we avoid are bites. Um, so physical harm um, from animal to, to human, so bites or scratches, or also if uh, that person were to slip or trip over an animal. Um, also, we have to we have to consider that not just animals are involved, that humans and humans uh, can, be, can have an altercation um, during a therapy animal session. So if there was a bystander, if there was something, an altercation between the therapist and the client or, or whatnot. The other thing that we have to think about is that could there be mental harm to any of those humans that are within that working environment? Um, could there be a verbal offense from human to human or think about how it feels for like if we're trying to bring a therapy animal to kind of make somebody else feel better or to reach a specific a specific goal and uh that animal has some sort of growl or bark or aggressive behavior or that they don't want to be involved with that to, with that participant how do you think that that is going to impact the participant who we're trying to benefit in this situation so that certainly can be an adverse outcome also, we have to think about the environmental hazards. Could we have a slip or trip of, of a person who gets hurt? And um, could there be an onset of the medical condition during the actual session? So like, what if they had a seizure um, or something dur during that? That might not necessarily be related to the session itself, but should still be considered an adverse event. In addition, talking about the animals that are involved, uh, like how can they be, or how can adverse um, events impact them? And so obviously, like it can be um, phys physical harm or, or so where the last thing that we want is a participant to be aggressive to an animal. But we also think about to like where they could inadvertently push a puncher or poke an animal um, that uh, that an animal like again, like if somebody trips or falls over an animal that uh, that animal could be hurt as well. And also that an animal could be stepped on or rolled on. So such as in this picture, this is a perfect picture to depict um, of a dog whose paw is right underneath the tire of a wheelchair and that definitely could cause a harm to an animal. In addition, could uh, there be environmental hazards for that animal? Could that animal be slipped on a, uh, could they slip on a floor, especially if they're older, if they have, are suffering from osteoarthritis or other sort of musculoskeletal conditions? Um, they could be closed on an elevator if, if, that, if that happens. And also when we're entering in medical facilities, especially, could they inadvertently consume medication that they weren't supposed to? and also the onset of a medical condition. So uh, again, or the worsening of a current condition that, that, that they have. So whether it's like seizures or some other thing that really causes them to, um, for their medical condition to be exacerbated. In addition, the environment or property could be um, involved in an adverse event. So uh, this is probably the biggest barrier that administrative, like uh, especially hospital administration might have against having animals come into the hospitals because they're, everybody's afraid of the defecation, urination, uh, vomit or drool, um, smells that those animals bring, scratches to the surface, <laughs> um, any noise, the noise pollution that can happen, especially if dogs dogs are, are barking or cats are meowing or, um, or, or so, or if you have like a friend, a bulldog who's in there and you're hearing him uh, breathe from across the hallway. Um, and then hair and dander that can be left at, left behind. And oh, and the picture that I also have here is of my dog Drizzy. His name is actually Drizzy because he has these like shoestring uh, pieces of drool that come off of him. And he always wears a bandana because of that. But I've definitely seen like the floor be slobbered on 
and other people's hands be slobbered on and it's it's gross but we do what we can with Drizzy. Um, so with these knowing that adverse events can actually happen why don't we ever hear about them? Why don't we ever hear about these negative things that can happen during a session? And I think that we have to think about all the stakeholders who are involved. Because if, like, let's say, if worst case scenario, that a person is bit. So, like, and a lot of times, if the the participant or that client is bit, um, that there is a lot of guilt and shame on the part behalf of the participant the handler the facilities program and the organization because whenever they see something like that happen they think that what it's going to mean is that oh my goodness this this animal especially if it's an animal if it's an adverse event that um an animal caused that that animal is going to be like um that they're no longer going to be allowed to be a therapy animal, that they're going to be punished, that they're going to be relinquished, all of these bad things that, that they think that, they, that can happen. So a lot of guilt and shame. In addition, um, I think that people think that it's perceived to be lots of work to report something like this, uh, like this when it happens and kind of what's involved and what's entailed when something like that does. And also lots of people, especially if it's not like a full bite that somebody has to go to the hospital necessarily for, it's just not that big of a deal, which is mostly what uh, what we hear um, in, in my involvement with therapy animal organizations. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, like that dog kind of like growled or they kind of bit me, but it didn't break the skin. So it's not that big of a deal. We don't have to say anything to anybody. But uh, what I would I would argue with is please say something. If you see something, say something. So that compelled me to also kind of investigate this. The, I, I know I'm looking at the negative aspects of human-animal interaction, but we're really trying to provide a safe space for all humans and animals. So what we did was we looked at habit. So this is our therapy animal organization called the Human Animal Bond in Tennessee. It's a therapy animal organization that's based out of the University of Tennessee, where we have been in existence since 1987, almost since Anthrozoos has been active. Um, we have currently have over 550 active teams, maybe not during COVID, but we definitely have had that many with over 80,000 contacts per year. Um, and so what we wanted to do was we wanted to look at voluntarily reported adverse events between uh, 2015 and 2020. Now, we don't have a formal um, route of um, kind of reporting adverse events, but I think from the study we will be, uh, because of what we generally found was that there were 14 adverse events that, uh, that happened, that happened involving one of our habit dogs. Six of those adverse events resulted in an injury to a human, and one of those adverse events uh, resulted in an injury to an animal. Um, so if you are interested in hearing more, that the, our publication in that is soon to come, is, um, is still in the progress and everything, but there are a lot of interesting details in that. But I think that this will probably be the first uh, publication that really shows that yeah, adverse events can happen in, uh, with, therapy, with therapy animals. And these are some ways to manage this. So um, back to Aya Cooks. Um, so back to that, that original thing that I was talking about was that a few publications reported the approval of an Aya Cook that uh, obviously the description of details of animals used very much varied and that adverse events on animals were rare and were identified generally after the completion of the study. What uh, we kind of uh, concluded was that IACUC approval may be an option to demonstrate that investigators are actively protecting animals and animal-assisted intervention research. So that's probably the first step that uh, I would advise that anybody who's going to, into research in this area do is to, first off, if you're using a live animal, get with your IACUC program. And commonly what I hear from, uh, from other researchers is that they say, yeah, I actually went to my iCook and they said that I didn't need one. And what I would I would say is that a lot of iCook com committees don't really know what to do with this type of research. And so it's also our job. We're trying to disseminate and educate our people who are on our iCook committees about this type of research and that, yeah, truly adverse events can happen. So let's take a look at it. Again, I think that most of these studies, they are of low risk, but it's not zero risk. Nothing is ever zero risk. And we should do our part in protecting uh, these animals. And protecting and protecting this field. 
So future directions um, is to report frequency of IACUCA use in broad literature uh, searches across all scientific journals, because we just uh, talked about anthrozoos in particular, but taking a look at other publications that include human animal interaction research. And I'd also like to assess, again, various institutions IACUC review protocols of the animal assisted intervention research. Um, it'd be interesting to see the frequency and reasons for rejected or revised uh, protocols, and also if they are keeping track of adverse event reports that happen during the research. And also to assess if IACUC approval influences research outcomes. If we are doing better to advocate for the welfare of these animals, is that going to be, be leading to better human outcomes? If that animal's having a, a better time during that, uh, during that session or whatnot, generally speaking, I think that that human is also going to feel the effects of that as well. My recommendations are that in any article that uh, is going to contain research regarding human animal interactions, that we explicitly state um, all of the details about the animals that are being used, because every single animal is going to, to be different across every single study. So the best that we can do to kind of replicate studies as best for that we can, which is, which is so needed in this field, is provide this proper signalment, um, to demonstrate or um, or illustrate what their experience and training is, what their health status is, whether or not they receive veterinary veterinary care, and also to detail the specific activity that is done with that animal. All too often, we take a look at these studies, and it's just kind of like, yeah, they were with a dog for 15 minutes, but they don't really talk about the specific duration, the frequency, intensity, how the animal was used, and also how stress and welfare was monitored. For for that, for that animal. And this is an area where I, I'm so impressed to also be seeing that a lot of research is going into this, into taking a look at stress and welfare and well-being of these therapy animals. And so when we ask how stress and welfare is monitored or stress and welfare in this research, the reason why it's important, it, important is because the animals used did not choose to participate out of their own volition. They didn't raise their paw to say, hey, mom, dad, I think I'd be a great volunteer for this, for this habit program. Can I do this? It's more or less, it's uh, the good heartedness and the goodwill of that volunteer to put their animal out there. And uh, in addition, we have to take that animal welfare perspective of, is this work causing undue stress? Um, do they enjoy that interaction or do they just tolerate it? Do they just tolerate it when they're getting a, a, a big bear hug? Um, is there an emotional toll on the animal, like whether that's short term or long term, especially depending on how much we're exposing them? And do they maintain the freedom to express normal behavior in a, um, during these sessions? And I always talk about that in the context of the five freedoms with the, the freedom to express normal behavior being one of the most important things that we can look at when we're taking a look at animal assisted interventions. So question, if we are monitoring, if this is becoming important and we as researchers and everything are kind of investigating this, how do we measure stress and animal welfare? Generally speaking, most of the articles that you're going to look at are going to have a combination of one or both of looking at behavior, of course, taking a look at how that animal's acting during, during these sessions, as well as some sort of physiologic me measurement, uh, cortisol being one of our most common because it is induced or elicited during that stress response. However, there are so many limitations and so much that we could talk about this. Like we could talk about this for hours, um, uh, but we have to recognize that there are limitations that behavior is going to vary significantly between individuals and so is cortisol that uh, cortisol that even though we see these elevations, a lot of times we're like, oh, cortisol is elevated. That means that this was bad, this was negative, but cortisol can absolutely also be elevated with positive excitement, with positive arousal. So what we have to know is that we must interpret both behavior and cortisol with caution in the context of that situation, which is what makes this uh, research so challenging, but also so, so fascinating at the same time. 
Um, so if, uh, so first talking about behavior in these situations, this is a picture. Um, these are photos of Kitty. His, uh, this is an eight year old uh, Pity uh, little mix who I was using as just kind of a demonstration dog, um, uh, kind of mimicking a therapy animal session, showing that uh, he is demonstrating these calming signals and these stress associated behaviors beautifully. That snout lick, that yawning, that kind of displacement behavior of searching around, of uh, body shaking, of uh, paw lifting, of having a crouched position, of turning away from an interaction. There's so many things that go into um, how an, that leads to our interpretation of an animal not really having a great time. So these are behaviors that we definitely want to see, like in research that we want to capture. And also it's the most practical thing that animal therapy therapy animal handlers can capture to assess their welfare and well-being. In the research that has been done, uh, there have definitely been a few studies that show that uh, these dogs used in, the, in therapy animal sessions show an increase in stress-associated behavior. Some of these studies have demonstrated that it is higher when those dogs are with children compared to adults, that um, one of those studies showed that there was an increase in behavioral signs of stress after a two-hour therapy session specifically. And another study demonstrated that lip licking and body shaking are the most common behaviors that are observed. However, just as we've seen an increase in stress-associated behavior, there are just as many studies that have shown that there's no increase in stress-associated behaviors when we are taking a look at therapy animals, that uh, there was absence of observed, observed behavior in dogs during animal-assisted therapy. Um, in, the study, in a study that I did, I found no difference uh, be in, in stress behaviors with those dog in a home setting, sitting at home. I recorded all these dogs when they were sitting at home for an hour compared to novel settings. And that another study also showed that there was no high stress behaviors in dogs in, uh, working in children's hospital. So the other thing that we should always uh, kind of pair up with behavior, because there are so many different things that are going to influence behavior, is pairing it up with a physiologic measure, such as cortisol. So what's really nice about cortisol um, is that you can measure it in numerous ways, from blood, saliva, hair, um, urine, and feces. And I'm actually currently looking, at, investigating, looking at hair cortisol as a measure of chronic stress in our therapy and also working dogs as, as well. Um, so it is a nice measure, but again, it's just a little piece of that picture. And in the studies that we've taken a look at to look at cortisol levels in therapy dogs, we've definitely seen that some dogs uh, have an elevation in cortisol, that they found that uh, levels were significantly higher on days of therapy compared to control days at home, and that there was a significant elevation between the start of and one after a therapy session in these dogs. And those were looking at salivary cortisol. But other studies, um, including one of, one of mine, showed that there was actually no increase in cortisol um, in, when comparing experienced or in-training therapy dogs. Um, again, those dogs compared to their therapy session in home setting, there was no difference. And there was no difference between baseline and 20 minutes after an intervention in, in a children's hospital. So that's kind of breaking down um, and showing a little bit more of that story, especially when we compare up cortisol with behavior. What we've seen from a lot of these studies is that even though there are some studies that say that, hey, there's increase in cortisol, hey, there's increase in like kind of stress associated behavior. Overall, none of these studies have kind of said that that arousal and that these increases are equating to negative welfare. So none of those dogs were suffering or, or anything else as far as what we can tell. And so that leads me to my conclusion from most of the research that is out there that currently there's no evidence to indicate that trained experienced animals and animal assisted interventions are adversely affected. Now, I also kind of challenge you to take that with a grain of salt, because these are all based on studies that are specifically looking at welfare um, of, of therapy animals. So we know that the researchers and investigators who are looking and like kind of intently looking at these dogs during these investigations, we know that if something bad happens, those dogs are going to be kicked out and they're going to be like, this dog shouldn't be used for, for, for therapy work. So again, just taking that with a grain of salt. But I agree that... Um, and 
and that it might be different from your general population of therapy animals with a handler who might not necessarily be aware of all these things. Uh, but in the research right now, it, it shows that we are taking good care of them and that they are not, they're not in a bad state. But in order to kind of complete that picture and where do we kind of go in the future, aside from the behavior and cortisol, which has been done over and over again, are there alternative methods of assessing animal welfare? Another fascinating area that, uh, that I love is kind of looking at exploring other tools to kind of complete the picture because cortisol, behavior, like they're only like little puzzle pieces of assessing that full animal's experience as a whole. So what, what other things do we have out there? Well, there are definitely other hormones out there that we can um, use to investigate and kind of tell us a little bit more of a picture of how that animal is feeling. We always hear so commonly about oxytocin as that bonding hormone of uh, what is going to be released when, uh, especially when moms bond, uh, bond to their children, especially when they're nursing. And what we've seen in multiple studies that uh, oxytocin increases in urine and plasma after positive human animal interaction. And there's actually an increase in gaze in dogs when uh, oxytocin is uh, administered intranasally, which is really interesting. Our other hormone that your premier, <laughs> premier researcher, Dr. McLean, um, here is to, to kind of tell the story. So I won't to really tell too much of the story. He's vasopressing. Um, I thought that his research was, was really exciting and innovative because we, we've seen that in humans that it's released within distinct brain areas upon stressful challenges and um, increases with psychological stress in humans. And there's so much to this, but at the end of the day, what I'm gleaning from Dr. McLean's research is that it decreases in dogs after human-animal interaction. And if we can uh, decrease that stress or show that dogs are actually not stressed out or even having a good time during that human-animal interaction is a hugely beneficial thing. So if we can continue these, uh, these measures of exploring these hormones, that would be wonderful. In addition, aside from hormones, and I'm, there, there's so many more hormones I would talk about, but I'm just skimming the surface, wanted to go into other uh, physiological outcomes that we could measure. And so one of those things is heart rate variability. Um, if you don't know, heart rate variability is different from heart rate specifically. So that heart rate is more influenced by our physical activity, whereas heart rate variability is influenced by psychological and emotional processes. And we kind of see in human, in the human literature, so much uh, that having a high heart rate uh, is actually is actually correlated with better health outcomes and better like emotional health, whereas low heart rate variability is associated with like higher incidences of like heart attack, heart attack and stroke, and also negative mental health states. And so with that information, what we're exploring is that can we explore emotional states in dogs using heart rate variability? And so there's been a couple of studies that have been out there that's exploring this, and this is really exciting. And I have <laughs> done a lot to kind of get these heart rate bar variability monitors working in our dogs. And so that's something that is, that is in process right now. And finally, if only, if only we could tell what a dog was thinking by decoding their brain. So the possibilities are endless of using functional MRI. I think that it's amazing to see what this research is doing, of seeing the, and an awake dog actually seeing what they're stimulated by and what parts of the brain that they're actually stimulated by. So there's a lot of work that goes into like training these dogs in order to sit in, in an MRI machine um, and to be able to take a look at all the images that, uh, that are in there. So there's such exciting work within that. And I would hope that one day uh, in order to progress this, uh, this, uh, this area of research, because it's pretty much these dogs have to sit perfectly perfectly still, and then you show them images or you put different scents in front of them and then you see what their responses in their brain are. But I would love it if it, we had an fMRI machine that was big enough to encompass both a dog and a human so that you could actually see that exchange of that interaction and see what's going on both in the human and the animals and the dog's brain. Because I think that most of the time, what we would say if, if they were in that fMRI machine, that our humans would have those light ups of brains of uh, light up in their area of brains that say like, I love you and where all that oxytocin release comes from. And we might also just see that a dog, all they're thinking is where's my next meal coming from? And I'm just thinking about that bone that I want. So it, it could go, go either way. We never know. 
but it's it's really exciting to know that that's a possibility with all the advances in science and in research. So just wanted to share with you, and I think that it's very uh, noteworthy that you are beginning this series because there's so many opportunities for this research to be further. I know that we always focus on like kind of what are the benefits for humans and what are human outcomes, but just wanted to know that there are lots of opportunities for this and I, I love seeing this grow and, and everything. And if you are just doing social science, not, not just social, social science research, but if you are involving an animal to really consider the, all those aspects about animals. So just to, in closing, I just wanted you to remember some take home points is that adverse events can happen in animal assisted interventions. Get an eye cook if you are doing research within this area. Um, and the more welfare and well-being parameters that you can evaluate, the more robust your interpretation of that animal's experience that is going to be. Like behavior is just one aspect. Cortisol is just one aspect. If you put them together along with vasopressin, along with oxytocin, along with heart rate variability, that's going to be amazing. And do your best at the end of the day to ensure that no animals were harmed. So with that, I would say that our obligations, if we want to protect all of our human-animal interactions and facilitate this, then we need to protect these. So they are our obligations first and foremost when we're talking about our animals. I'll end there. So thank you so much for your time and attention. And I am happy to answer. Questions.